is Thea Brennan Carr, a crone. Uh, Thea is, has an AB with honors, and she can speak to you in either Greek or Latin uh, from Brown, Brown and her MD from Stanford. Her residency was in, in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Boston, followed by a fellowship in ID there and a second fellowship in medical microbiology at BIDMC. She is a member of the American Society for Microbiology and a fellow of the Academy of Pediatrics. She has many honors and prizes, including the Maxwell Finland Award for Excellence in Research from the Mass Infectious Disease Society for some of her research endeavors. She has more than a half a dozen funded and unfunded research projects underway, is involved in medical student house, house officer teaching, uh, has a dozen or more publications, most in peer-reviewed journals. She serves as an ID attending at Children's and a postdoctoral researcher at the Kirby Labs, as it says there, at BIDMC. Her research involves her research involves uh, the use of an automated digital dispensing system. Fascinating to evaluate a broad range of antimicrobial combinations for evidence of synergistic activity against a collection of carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, enterobacteria strains. She is well on her way to becoming an authority on antimicrobial synergy and combination therapy for multidrug-resistant organisms, including the one I just mentioned. As rates of multi-drug resistant organisms continue to grow and rise worldwide and combination therapy consequently grows in importance, such expertise will be needed in order to propel the development of guidelines for treatment of patients infected with these pathogens. Please welcome Dr. Brennan Cohen. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks very much for having me. Um, thinking of stories of cute things kids have said and looking at the composition of the audience, I'll tell a quick story before I start. My four-year-old was um, talking about somebody who she knew, who's, we were telling her about somebody whose dad was a doctor, and she looked kind of confused, and she said, but I thought it's usually mommies who are doctors. So <laughs> it can be either, but it's nice to see a lot of a lot of female doctors. So anyway, I thought I would talk about tick-borne infections in children because um, mostly I'll be mostly talking about Lyme. Um, it's something we see a lot, obviously, in this area, but I think no matter how many times you've seen it, it can always throw kind of a curveball one type or another. And because it's so seasonal, this is also the time of year where, um, at least I personally find I always need to kind of review everything I used to know about Lyme that's kind of faded over the course of the winter. So I thought it was kind of a timely Discussion. I have um, no financial disclosures. I will be talking about some non or some off label uses of doxycycline in particular um, for kids under eight and for Lyme meningitis. Those are not FDA approved indications, but um, I'll be discussing those. Uh, so, most of what I'll talk about is going through kind of the clinical stages of Lyme disease, diagnosis, and treatment. Probably a little bit more of an emphasis on diagnosis because I think that's probably the trickiest part of Lyme. Um, and then uh, what I'll intersperse throughout are some challenging scenarios in pediatric Lyme. So these are cases either that I've seen or also that I've gotten calls from. We um, take calls from pediatricians and emergency doctors and family doctors in the New England area at, um, at ID at Children's about kind of tough cases. And during the summer, they're often about Lyme. So I've tried to include some of the scenarios that come up there as things that are, you know, I think potentially useful to think through. And then I'll talk briefly at the end about other tick-borne infections in Massachusetts, namely Babesia and Anaplasma. Not as much because those are less common, especially in kids, although I think they're both, particularly Babesia, becoming more common. Um, and I can talk more or less about those depending on how the time goes and what people are interested in. Um, so starting with Lyme disease. Much of what I'm talking about comes from these two resources, which I very much um, recommend in general, but especially for Lyme. So the AAP Red Book, hopefully 
everyone has access to that in one form or another. Um, it has a very good Lyme chapter. So this is the American um, Academy of Pediatrics official guidebook on infectious diseases, and it's pediatric specific. It's pretty pretty well um, written, pretty clear. And then the Infectious Diseases Society of America also publishes a guideline. This is, it was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases, but it's open access, it's available from the IDSA website and from the journal website. Um, and this goes through Lyme, Anaplasma, and Babesia um, in quite a bit of detail. It's not pediatric specific, but it has a lot of, you know, it has appropriate information for children. The only caveat is that this guideline is pretty old, it's from 2006. And there's another one in the works which is slated to come out um, this fall, or these sometimes end up getting pushed back a little bit. So we'll see. It's certainly for this coming tick season, it's going to be the old guideline. Um, and so in these slides where I've talked about sort of recommendations or guidelines or dosing without a specific reference on the slide, it comes from these two guidelines, which are pretty much concordant. Um, and I find this helpful to refer to, particularly in Lyme, where a lot of times, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of confusing information for families on the internet, and people come in sometimes with a lot of anxiety about it, I think it's a particularly helpful disease to be able to sort of say and to know we're doing what the guideline says. Sometimes things fall out of the guidelines, outside of sort of the purview of the guidelines, and we'll talk about that, but that's where I find these two things useful. So uh, Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne infection in America, um, and around here we're kind of at the epicenter. It's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a spirochete, um, somewhat related to syphilis, to trypanema pallidum. Um, and it comes through the bite of a deer tick, Ixodes scapularis. So these are the small ticks, not the big ones. And it's very, very prevalent where we are. So when they do samples of ticks throughout the state, they find that about a third of ticks of, of um, deer ticks in Massachusetts are infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. And this is useful to know. This will kind of come up later, but just in terms of the likelihood that a patient who's been bitten will actually get Lyme disease. Um, this is definitely a high prevalence area. So one of the things that's a little tricky about Lyme disease, but also interesting, is how many different manifestations it can have. It can present in a lot of, um, a lot of different ways. And they're usually classified as early localized disease, early disseminated disease, and late disease. And this is useful partly just sort of from a pathophysiologically interesting way, perhaps. But uh, I think practically it's useful for two reasons. One is that it gives you a sense of the timing of these manifestations. So if you know that the patient had a specific tick exposure or a likely tick exposure when they were out camping, um, or just you know based on the time of year, you can have a sense of how likely any of these manifestations are. And it's useful also in terms of figuring out what type of diagnostic testing, lab testing will or will not be useful. So most of the manifestations fall in this early disseminated disease category. Um, and that's where uh, one of the stages where serology antibody testing is useful. So that's multiple erythema migraines, the neurologic manifestations, and carditis. And then it's pretty easy to remember because early localized disease in terms of specific findings is really just the single erythema migraine, single bullseye rash. And then late disease is arthritis. Um, in both early localized and early disseminated disease, you can have constitutional symptoms as well. So um, fever, which is usually described as low grade, although it certainly doesn't have to be malaise, um, fatigue, headache, myalgias, arthralgias. And in fact, in early localized disease with a single erythema migraines, headaches and even some degree of neck stiffness can actually be, um, be pretty prominent. You don't have full meningitis or nickel rigidity, but it's worth noting that those can actually be pretty prominent among the constitutional symptoms. So starting with early localized Lyme disease, this typically occurs within one to two weeks of a tick bite. So usually that sort of seven to 14 day range is the most common time. It can happen sooner than that, uh, but it's usually around there. And the only real specific physical finding um, that gives you, that sort of tells you that this is likely early localized Lyme is the bullseye rash, the single erythema migraines rash. You can have constitutional symptoms with it, but without the rash, they're really not specific enough to you know, tell you that it's Lyme. And the diagnosis at this point is pretty much entirely clinical um, for a couple of reasons. First is that if you see the rash, it's characteristic enough, especially if you're in an area like this where it's very common and if it's in the summer, that it's so likely to be Lyme disease, there's really no need for any other testing. But um, also, the testing just really isn't useful because this is usually before you've mounted an antibody response. So the majority of patients won't have an antibody response at this stage. It depends a little bit on how far out it is from the tick bite and how long the rash has been there. But the general recommendation is not to do any lab testing at this point and just make the diagnosis clinically. Now the challenge is not everyone with early localized Lyme has a single erythema or has an erythema migraines rash. And we know that because we have, you know, patients will come in with 
later stages of disease with no memory of an erythema migrans. Um, in fact, they usually don't have any memory of it because it would have probably been treated if they had. So if somebody comes in in the summer with sort of vague constitutional symptoms um, and a you know, relatively recent tick bite or they're just sort of in a wooded area, you're in a slightly tough situation. There really isn't useful testing for it. We don't generally recommend testing or treating for Lyme at that point, but it can be tough. You know, a, a family can be pretty worried about it. And this is a stage where it's pretty straightforward if you have the rash. If you don't, you really don't have a great way of knowing. Um, these are just some examples of the erythema migrans rash. The top two are single. The bottom two are multiple erythema migrans. This would actually be a manifestation of early disseminated disease, but it's just for some more pictures. Um, so th most of these are kind of classic bullseye rashes. Sometimes there's more of a dot in the middle, especially if the rash forms around the bite, but it doesn't always. Um, and then this is one that's a little bit atypical looking. And um, they can certainly have a lot of atypical appearances. They should usually be five centimeters in largest diameter, but they don't always start out that way. So if a patient comes in and they have something small that maybe looks like it's going in that direction, you can always have them um, come back in in a day or two. It's not, you know, there's, it's not an emergency situation to treat, um, and you can see if it's developing in that direction or if it's sort of a, just a mosquito bite that looked funny and, and goes away. These lesions do, interestingly, have spirochetes in them, so they can be biopsied and you can potentially see the spirochetes in specialty labs, you can culture them. This is never really done because it's a characteristic enough rash and the treatment is straightforward enough, but it's kind of an interesting fact. And so that's why initially you see just the one, usually near the site where the tick bit, not always. Um, and then when you see the multiple ones, that's because you've had spirochetes going through the blood and setting up shop all over. So that's kind of an interesting factoid. So for um, treatment for early localized disease, for kids who are under eight, or who for any other reason can't take doxycycline. Amoxicillin is first line, cefuroxime is also reasonable. And then kids over eight and adults, or kids eight and older, doxycycline is the first line option. So this is the first kind of challenging vignette, and I think this comes up pretty often. So say you have a kid who comes in, six years old, she has early localized Lyme, but she has an amoxicillin allergy. So what do you do? And this is a case, I would say, where there's not one, one simple answer, and there's you know, you kind of have to weigh some of the family and patient factors and your own comfort with different management options and um, your, you know, options for getting allergy testing. But anyway, so the first choice is just giving them oxycillin. So generally you wouldn't do this, but there are certainly many, many patients with reported allergies that don't have true allergies. You can sometimes figure this out with allergy testing. So if you have an option to get a patient seen rapidly in an allergy clinic and have skin testing done, that's one option. It's not, you know, if the patient's not systemically unwell, it isn't an emergency to treat them if there's a couple of days delay, but um, that's often not, you know, sort of practically feasible in the immediate term. Um, occasionally, the history of an uh, allergy is, you know, you ask a little bit about it, and it really was clearly not an allergy. The patient had some loose stools when they had amoxicillin, which is really sort of just a side effect. And you could consider just using it in that case. This is a little hard to do if someone has a documented amoxicillin allergy and they haven't been evaluated by an allergist, but every now and then you'll get a history that just is reassuring enough that you can just do that. But then the second option, if it sounds like it was an allergy, but it wasn't an immediate onset hypersensitivity um, type of reaction, for example, if you had a rash, if they had a rash that started a few days in, um, then cefuroxime is an option. So there's overall pretty low cross-reactivity between cephalosporins and penicillins. <laughs> There's some, but not a lot, and it varies depending, the rates vary depending on the cephalosporin. And cefuroxime is one that actually has very low rates of cross-reactivity. So if the, you know, if you had a, a full-blown anaphylactic reaction to amoxicillin, you still probably would want to be a little cautious with this, but for the majority of allergy histories, um, between the possibility that it may not have been a true allergy to amoxicillin and the low rate of cross-reactivity, um, and the fact that most, you know, even if there were some cross-reactivity, most allergic responses uh, or allergic reactions aren't immediately life-threatening. Putting all those things together, it's generally reasonably safe to give a cephalosporin, especially one that has a low rate of cross-reactivity. So this would kind of be a conversation with the family. You could consider giving the first dose in the office and observing a little. That's not sort of an official um, graded challenge, but it gives you a little, may give you a little bit more comfort. Um, and then what about doxycycline? So the reason we generally don't give doxycycline in kids eight and under is because of concern for tooth staining. Doxycycline is a tetracycline antibiotic. Tetracycline definitely stained developing teeth, so if kids' adult teeth hadn't fully developed, it would stain the teeth. They don't have to be all the way erupted um, for the concern to be over. They just have to be 
fully grown under the gums. Um, so that was why eight was the usual cutoff. But it seems at this point pretty clear that the risk of tooth staining with doxycycline is much, much lower than with tetracycline. Possibly it doesn't even occur at all. We don't have data enough to say that confidently. But people have looked at this retrospectively in kids who were treated with doxycycline um, for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So there we have a disease with very high mortality if it's untreated and where doxycycline is clearly the first line drug. Um, you know, we don't see that much around here, but kids of all ages are treated right off the bat with doxycycline because even if there is a tooth staining risk, it's far outweighed by the risk of not treating Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So anyway, that gives you a population of kids who've been treated with doxycycline and they're um, in one of these references here was a retrospective study and none of those kids had tooth staining. Those are shorter courses generally of doxycycline than you would use for Lyme. Um, but, uh, but still it's, it's worth noting. And then there's another study that looked more broadly at kids with courses up to I think 10 days. So a little shorter than the 14 day course. But again didn't really see any tooth staining. So I think we don't know definitively whether there's a risk of tooth staining. There may be and I think it's sort of would, would not be accurate to tell a family that there's no risk of this, but the risk is definitely lower than with tetracycline. And if you have a kid who's six, who probably has most of her adult teeth formed, if not, you know, even if not all, again, it's sort of a risk benefit thing that you can discuss with the family. Um, but if none of these are viable options, there is azithromycin as an alternative, but it truly is a second line drug. It's not as effective. So, uh, so that's why we don't generally just hop to that if there's, you know, an amoxicillin allergy, you don't just sort of it's, uh, it's worth investigating a little bit what the nature of the allergy is and how you and the family feel about some of these other options. But if there really is no way that you can give amoxicillin or cefiroxim or doxycycline, azithromycin um, can be effective, but it's not always. Um, so here's another scenario that comes up. You have a seven-year-old boy. He has uh, erythema migraines rash. He gets treated. He's doing fine. But his parents want to know, did the treatment really work? Um, can we test to make sure that it was cleared? So the short answer is this isn't recommended because um, treating early localized Lyme can blunt the antibody response. So you may not see an antibody response um, or you may see less of a response after treatment, but it also sometimes doesn't. And you can end up with um, positive antibodies. They can persist for a long time. It doesn't mean that there was treatment failure. It's not, um, the situation is not like syphilis where you can track the antibody responses uh, or the antibody levels as a treatment response. So you really don't know either way. And it can be, I think, confusing to families because if you get this test and there's no antibody response and sometimes people say, oh, was it really Lyme? But it probably, you know, if it was a classic rash, it probably was. The antibody response was just blunted by treatment. On the other hand, if you do develop an antibody response, it doesn't indicate treatment failure. So there's really not any useful information from this. Um, so we don't recommend follow-up testing in this scenario. And it's, it's important to note that both IgM and IgG antibodies can persist for a long time. Um, for months to years, and that's a little bit unusual in the case of IgM, where in most diseases that's sort of, uh, you know, the acute phase um, antibody. For whatever reason, these can stay positive for a long time in Lyme. So this can really complicate things in an area like this, where people can get multiple Lyme infections over the course of their lives, or even over the course of a couple of years. Um, and so that's, uh, will come up later in terms of some of the challenges of diagnosis, but in this scenario, we would say if you treated with an appropriate regimen and um, the patient's doing fine. There's no real role for testing. So moving on to early disseminated Lyme disease. This is where most of the, um, all the other manifestations come in. And these can occur within weeks to months of a tick bite. So there's a pretty good range, but it's not generally many months. So you'll usually still see these within summer or fall. It would be less likely to see somebody in February or something with one of these manifestations, although I think we're seeing ticks out and about for longer and longer periods of the year, so it can happen, but you typically expect it um, within the weeks to months range. And uh, so you can see a multiple erythema migraines rash, like I mentioned before, and then this is where you see Bell's palsy, meningitis, um, and carditis. Carditis is less common overall and particularly uncommon in children, but it can happen, and this is when it would happen. So the diagnosis at this point, again, is clinical, very much based on, on presentation and on living in an endemic area. But this is the point where antibody testing starts to become useful as well. And um, so I'm going to, before going into the clinical manifestations, I'm going to talk a little bit about the antibody testing for Lyme because I think it's very confusing, to be honest. Um, it's a two-tiered system, which is essentially a screening test and a confirmatory test. I put those in quotes because the Red Book makes a point of saying these shouldn't be thought of as a screening and confirmatory test. They're actually part of an integrated whole. But 
frankly, the way the algorithm works, I think I don't really see the distinction, and I think it's useful to think of them as screening and confirmatory, but that's why those words are in quotes. So they're both immunoassay tests. The difference is um, in their sensitivity and specificity, and it's in which um, particular antigens they look for a response to and in the exact type of immunoassay. Um, so the first test is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, so it's either called an ELISA or an EIA. And then the second is a Western blot or immunoblot test. So the first one, um, this can also be a little confusing, so it'll be described in a test dictionary usually as Lyme disease antibody or Lyme disease antibody total, but it can be called different things. And usually when you're ordering these tests, you will order them as sort of a set. So you would order this test, and if it's positive or equivocal, it'll reflex to the Western blot. And that's really how they should be ordered. They shouldn't be ordered separately. So you don't want to do a Western blot if you haven't done this, this initial test because it's not um, specific and enough. So you could have a false positive if you do the Western blot without having done this test first. Um, and likewise, this one on its own, unless it's negative, doesn't give you the full answer. So a positive could be false positive here, too. Um, and the result you'll get in this is a single number. Uh, and it'll be interpreted as ne negative, equivocal, or positive. If it's negative, then you're done. That's, it's a sensitive enough test um, in the appropriate stage of Lyme disease that there's no more testing that's needed. Now, again, remember, if you send this in early localized disease, it will likely be negative because the patient hasn't mounted an antibody response yet. But if you're at a stage in disease where you expect a response um, and it's negative, then you can you know, pretty much say this is a Lyme disease. If it's positive or equivocal, it's not conclusive. That could still be a false positive. And so then you move on to second tier Western blot testing. Um, the actual value of the number doesn't generally matter. So if it's positive, there's not too much utility. There's maybe some exceptions to this, but generally there's not much utility in looking at what the actual number is, whether it's really high or low, as long as it's above the cutoff, it's positive, um, and vice versa. There are some labs that are making things more confusing by doing testing IgM and IgG separately at this stage. Um, but it's still, a, even if that happens and you see it, it's still a screening test and you still have to wait for the subsequent results. Um, so next is the Western blot. So like I mentioned, this should only be done um, if, the, uh, if the EIA or ELISA is positive. Otherwise, um, it's hard to know what to do with the results. You could have a false positive here as well. Most labs, at least send out labs, do allow you to order it individually. So it can be sort of overridden, but we wouldn't recommend it. And this is, I think, where things get extra confusing because um, the test is reported in terms of number of positive bands. Um, and this is just sort of referring to the bands on the Western blot gel, so how many antigens the patient's antibodies reacted to. And for IgM, they test three different bands, in other words, three different antigens. And for IgG, they test 10 different ones. For IgM to be positive, you have to have two or more positive bands, so either two or three positive. For IgG, it has to be five or more bands. Uh, but the way that they report these out can be a little bit confusing because often they'll list all of the bands. They'll list what you know the names of each of them, which really doesn't matter at all. Um, I don't, I don't know why they necessarily need to list all of these because you end up often with pages and pages of results and positive, negative, positive, positive, negative, and you have to kind of sort through them. They'll usually somewhere say at the end, you know, overall IgG positive, you know, so many bands positive. But you sometimes have to pick through that to find it because you can have, you know, if you have both an IgM and IgG being tested, you could have. Um, my math is, you know, f total of five different bands between the two of them positive and still not actually have either be positive. So it's worth looking at carefully. Um, it doesn't matter which bands are positive. So again, I think, I sometimes think the reporting of this test makes it seem more complicated than it is. Um, apart from, you know, sort of research purposes, we don't really generally care too much which ones are positive. And then um, one thing to note for this test is that you can have false positive IgM results even if you followed the algorithm appropriately. Uh, even if you had a positive ELISA and then do this. And this is kind of true across the board for IgMs for almost any kind of infection. It's just sort of a, there can be a lot of cross-reactivity. There can be IgMs that the body starts revving up um, non-specifically when it's infected. So IgMs are always good to be a little bit skeptical of for anything, virus, bacteria, if they don't fit clinically. Um, and it's certainly true here. So where this comes up is that there's really a pretty small window where you would expect to have an IgM and no IgG. IgG should start coming up within four weeks of the tick bite if you're infected. So if you have one of the manifestations of early disseminated Lyme, most of the time you should already have a positive IgG. It can, you can start to have these symptoms before that, but um, there shouldn't be a very long window. So if you've had um, symptoms for four weeks uh, and you get just a positive um, IgM, 
then you should be a little bit suspicious. Sometimes you can, it's worth just testing again in a couple of weeks and seeing whether the IgG was sort of just about to pop up positive. But that's a, a bit of a caveat there. Um, so into the clinical manifestations of early disseminated Lyme, um, the, there's the multiple erythema migraines, which is just sort of the same as one rash, but multiple ones. Facial nerve palsy or Bell's palsy is pretty common. Um, a couple interesting points about this. As far as we know, treating it doesn't actually speed the resolution. And the real reason to treat is to prevent late manifestations, so to prevent arthritis. Um, and it's, you know, I think worth explaining to patients just so that they don't necessarily have an expectation that they're going to start getting better as soon as they're being treated. It's really to, uh, to prevent late manifestations. Now, one issue that starts to come up, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is the division between, uh, or the distinction between isolated Bell's palsy and meningitis with Bell's palsy. So sometimes it's very clearly just the facial, you know, droop and nothing else going on. Sometimes you have clearly full-blown meningitis, but it can be a little confusing. If you get an LP on somebody who just has uh, Bell's palsy with Lyme um, and doesn't have any clinical manifestations of meningitis, you can still see some cells in the CSF. Um, so generally, and there's a little, this is a little bit controversial, but generally we don't recommend getting an LP if you just have, um, right, I shouldn't really say it's controversial. We really don't usually recommend getting an LP if you have just facial nerve palsy, but if you do for some reason and see some cells, but the patient clinically really doesn't have meningitis, um, doesn't have nickel rigidity or severe headache or anything like that, then it's probably the other, truly a Lyme CSF infection. Um, and steroid therapy for facial nerve palsy due to Lyme is not usually recommended. Sometimes, of course, you're trying to sort out what the cause is and whether it's Lyme or um, whether it's more likely HSV. But if you're uh, pretty clear that it's Lyme with a positive test and a reasonable exposure history, then we don't usually use steroids. Um, and this can take a while to resolve. And again, treatment doesn't speed the resolution of it, but it does in almost all cases resolve eventually. Um, and then meningitis. So Lyme meningitis generally is a little bit more subacute than classic bacterial meningitis. People are not usually as sick, but it is meningitis. They have CSF inflammation and, you know, they present um, as meningitis, but it's certainly not going to look like meningococcal meningitis or something like that. This study that people talk about a lot, the rule of sevens, was looking at um, distinguishing Lyme meningitis from viral or kind of aseptic meningitis in kids, because that often is sort of what the distinction comes down to. You often are, you know, maybe reasonably comfortable that it's not a um, homophilus meningitis or something like that, but you're not sure whether it's Lyme or viral meningitis. So these criteria they came up with are for identifying kids who are at very low risk of Lyme meningitis, again, if you're between <coughs> Lyme and viral meningitis. I think to make it um, be all sevens, they kind of Made, made the rules, in my opinion, slightly confusing. But anyway, the point is you're at low risk of Lyme meningitis, so higher risk of viral meningitis. If you've had fewer than seven days of headache, if you're um, among your CSF cells, fewer than 75% are mononuclear, so monocytes and lymphocytes, and if you have no seventh nerve palsy. So I think kind of the easier way to think of it is the people who, the things that are suspicious for Lyme meningitis are a longer duration of headache, um, a very high percent CSF mononuclear cell percentage, and obviously if you have a seventh nerve palsy, it's, it's quite suggestive. The, um, the CSF profile, I think, is a little confusing because in both of these cases, you're going to primarily have mononuclear cells. Neither viral nor Lyme meningitis will be mostly neutrophils. Um, but in Lyme, it's even more tilted towards um, mononuclear cells. So in terms of diagnosis, you have, you, know, you have these clues here. So these may help you to rule out somebody who you just think really does not have Lyme meningitis. They just had a couple days of headache. They have no seventh nerve palsy. Um, they have more than 30% neutrophils in their CSF. But, um, but that may not always be, you know, you may not always know for sure. PCR can be sent from the CSF, but it's really not a good test. It has um, very low sensitivity. There are antibody tests from the CSF, which I'm not going to go into. I don't think they're not usually necessary, and that tends to be more of an issue in sort of um, more chronic, kind of ambiguous cases. So usually this is a diagnosis based on blood, just um, peripheral blood serologies and clinical manifestations and being in the right place at the right time. So a kid with... Um, with meningitis with a you know, cell count somewhere in the hundreds or um, a little bit below hundreds that's mostly mononuclear cells in the summer in Massachusetts um, who has a positive Lyme IgG has a pretty good chance of having Lyme meningitis. And then carditis I'll just mention briefly because again it's very uncommon in, um, in kids. So uh, 
AV heart block is the most common manifestation. You can also have myocarditis or pericarditis. And there's certain criteria for when children with Lyme carditis should be hospitalized. If they're symptomatic, if they have um, second or third degree heart block, or if they have a prolonged fear integral with first degree heart block. There's some question about whether kids who have other manifestations of early disseminated Lyme should have an EKG done routinely no matter what. And there's some disagreement about this in the guidelines. I think it's, you know, if you have the availability of an EKG, it's pretty, you know, low risk um, test to do, but it's also very uncommon, so. So treatment gets a little bit more complicated here. If you have just multiple erythema migrans or an isolated facial nerve palsy, then the treatment's the same as it would be for early localized disease. You can sort of pick it would be amoxicillin as first line for younger kids, doxycycline as first line for older kids, and the duration's the same. Um, so for meningitis, what we've traditionally done as first line treatment is ceftriaxone for 14 days. There's a range, 10 to 21 days. Generally, 14 days, though, is okay. Um, you can also do cefotaxime if you have some reason to do that, want to do that instead. You can do penicillin, but that's much more inconvenient for patients because it has to be IV penicillin. And then doxycycline. So this is a little bit controversial, um, and I'll actually I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, so I'll leave it there for now. One thing I'll note, though, is if you do do doxycycline for Lyme meningitis, the dosing range goes up to a pretty high dose of doxycycline that you won't really see for anything else, so four to eight weeks per kid per day where normally um, four mg per, per day is the max, and the dose max goes up to 200 mg per dose. Um, so just that's worth keeping in mind. You can sort of choose within that range, but I think since we're kind of newer to using doxycycline for Lyme meningitis in this country, um, a lot of people, myself included, feel a little bit more comfortable going with this higher, um, higher end of the dosing range, but it's important to know because it's different than pretty much anything else. Um, and then carditis is treated basically IV if the patient needs to be hospitalized for it, and oral if they don't. Um, so getting into some of this um, Bell's palsy and meningitis treatment ambiguities. So here's a scenario, a 14-year-old boy who has Bell's palsy, um, but no meningeal signs. So generally, in this case, we wouldn't recommend doing a lumbar puncture because, again, as I said, you may see some cells in the CSF, but if you don't clinically have meningitis, we wouldn't probably think that that's actually caused by um, CSF Lyme infection. However, if you're, you know, as we're starting to potentially move to treating more of these patients with doxycycline, it may not be as important to make that distinction. So if, um, if you're going to treat Lyme meningitis with doxycycline anyway, and you have a patient who clinically you're not concerned about another form of bacterial meningitis or HSV you know, meningitis or anything like that, then um, I think we usually do still get a lumbar puncture, but you could argue that there's not really anything that's going to change based on that. So here's where this question comes in. So you have a 12-year-old girl diagnosed with Lyme meningitis, and um, her parents really don't want to, they're not comfortable using a PICC line at home. They really don't want to give um, IV ceftriaxone at home for two weeks. So what do you do? What about this doxycycline option? And that doxycycline recommendation is listed as one of the options in the Red Book now with sort of a footnote, and I'll, I'll kind of mention what the footnote's about, but the caveat is the IDSA guidelines discuss it. I think they don't list it as one of the sort of first line options, but they have a discussion about it. And I think it'll be interesting to see what they recommend in the new guideline coming out. Because people have been using doxycycline for a long time in Europe um, to treat Lyme meningitis. And the reason people have been a little, and have had success in studies have shown it, you know, it seems to work as well as ceftriaxone. People have been reluctant to adopt it here based on that data because there are some differences in Borrelia species. There's not really any specific evidence or reason to think that doxycycline would be less effective against Lyme meningitis caused by the North American, you know, versions of the species, but because the data is from there, that's sort of the argument for not just applying it, you know, directly to the population here. So, um, you know, I, I think people do different things, and it's a situation where you kind of have to balance the, um, the uncertainty about the efficacy of doxycycline in this scenario with the risks of prolonged home IV antibiotic therapy, which are not negligible. People get pick line infections and they get clots. Um, and it's a lot of you know work for a family. Some families sort of it's not a big deal. For others, it's pretty you know anxiety inducing and stressful and whatnot. Um, or they just sort of based on their circumstances just may not be able to do it. So if it's going to mean two weeks of hospitalization, it's gonna, you know for a younger kid if they can't do home IV antibiotics, then um, that starts to have pretty significant costs. Um, so this you know again I think it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a, a judgment call and people are doing different things. We still generally I would say in our division do ceftriaxone as first line, but I think that this is changing and 
um, if there's, you know, if there's a reason not to do it or if there's a strong subtraxin allergy. I think more and more we're using doxycycline. And the other, you know, while we don't want to be cavalier about Lyme meningitis, the fact is if you do a course of doxycycline and you really, it doesn't seem like it worked, you generally have the option to then do a subtraxin course. It isn't, it's not the optimal scenario, but it isn't like other types of meningitis where you have no wiggle room with, you know, doing anything less than the most effective therapy immediately. So moving on to late Lyme disease, this is, so this is basically arthritis, Lyme arthritis. Um, this can occur really any time after the tick bite, um, months to even years. So this could be any time of year. You can see this in the middle of winter. Um, and uh, it's, arthritis is pretty much the main manifestation at this point. So the diagnosis, again, it, partly it's clinical. So you, um, I'll talk about the manifestations a little bit, but it's usually monoarticular. The knee is classic. Um, there tends to be a lot of swelling, but not as much pain as you might expect. So it tends to be clinically, and not usually high fevers, tends to be not too hard to distinguish from, um, you know, a, a typical purulent septic arthritis with staph or something like that. Um, serology is useful here because by this point, IgG should pretty much 100% always be positive. So in early disseminated Lyme, that's true mostly, but sometimes you have manifestations that start popping up a little bit before the IgG because this is a late manifestation you should definitely have a positive IgG. So if your IgG is negative, that's helpful. It really, really argues against um, Lyme arthritis. But as I'll mention, sometimes you can have a uh, positive IgG for other reasons and ignore them. Know. You can send PCR from joint fluid if you tap the joint. And um, unlike in the CSF, PCR from joint fluid is actually pretty sensitive if the patient hasn't been treated yet. So the sensitivity goes down if they've sort of been empirically treated or they happen to be getting antibiotics, you know, amoxicillin for an ear infection at the same time or something like that then it's not necessarily as good a test, um, although it's still useful if it's positive. But the sensitivity is quite good if, um, if the patient hasn't been treated at all. So if, you, if you're pretty confident about the diagnosis, you may not need to tap the knee. There's sort of no point in doing this. But if it's being tapped anyway, or if you're not sure, that's an additional piece of diagnostic information. Um, so like I mentioned, it's usually monoarticular, so usually just one joint. Usually the large joints in the knee is, I would say, by far the most common. You can have a pretty prominent effusion, and there is typically pain, um, but it's not always very, not always as extreme as you might expect based on the size of the effusion and not as much as you would usually see um, with a staph or strep, septic arthritis. And again, the PCR can be useful at this point. Um, so treatment for a first round of arthritis is the same as early localized disease, but longer. So it's oral treatment, amoxicycline or doxycycline for 28 days. This late, um, arthritis is one of kind of the few things, the few manifestations of Lyme where we sometimes do sort of do further treatment. Usually, as I'll mention, we, um, you know, there isn't good evidence for doing prolonged extra treatment courses, but Lyme arthritis does sometimes recur. So if you have a recurrence after treatment or if your symptoms are clearly not resolved at the end of 28 days, you can just repeat the same course um, or you can do a course of subtriaxone. If it, I think I talk about this later, but if... After that, you're still having ongoing symptoms. The thought is that that's um, probably due either to residual inflammation without infection or to kind of an autoimmune process that was you know, potentially triggered by the initial arthritis. And that at that point, you want to start getting a rheumatologic evaluation and maybe treating uh, more symptomatically with um, NSAIDs, which are useful during Lyme treatment as well. Um, so here's another scenario of a 12-year-old boy who a couple years ago had Lyme meningitis, and now he's coming in with right knee arthritis. Um, and it sort of looks like it could be Lyme arthritis. His knee is swollen, um, but he's not acutely ill. So Lyme disease, this can definitely happen. Um, Lyme disease, unfortunately, does not confer lasting immunity, and people are frequently reinfected. The one kind of anecdotal thing that... Um, that I've been taught by our division Lyme disease expert, and I don't know what, I'll be honest, that I don't know how, what the data is for it, but that we rarely seem to see patients who had Lyme arthritis and then have Lyme again. It seems like the, the um, immune response is so strong to that that there is potentially some immunity that's conferred by having Lyme arthritis, um, but that's sort of not, an, not necessarily an absolute thing. Other stages of Lyme, though, don't. So if you had Lyme meningitis or Lyme carditis or certainly early localized Lyme, you can definitely get it again. But the tricky thing is, while you don't have lasting immunity, you can have um, persistent IgG that's not protective. So usually, as I mentioned, though, um, 
kind of the key to the diagnosis of Lyme arthritis is a positive IgG with a consistent clinical picture. But in this patient, you may very well have a persistently positive IgG, um, and you don't know what it's from. So if you, um, if you, it's still worth getting the serologist. If you have a negative IgG, you can feel comfortable that it's not Lyme arthritis. But if it's positive, it can be a little harder to know. This is a case where testing the joint fluid can definitely be useful. And sometimes you end up at a point where you say, you know, 28 days of amoxicillin or you know, doxycycline may just be the most reasonable course, and even if there's a little bit of ambiguity. Um, so another challenge, this is not, this is sort of moving on from the clinical stages, but just things that come up. So you find a four-year-old or a four-year-old boy's parents find that he's got a tick attached to his scalp. So can you do something to prevent Lyme? So the IDSA guidelines give recommendations on when you can use antibiotic prophylaxis. And they kind of say, oh, this isn't really recommended, but you can do it. Um, what prophylaxis is, is a single dose of doxycycline, four mix per kg, a maximum of 200 milligrams. Um, but they say you have to have all the following criteria met. So the tick has to be an adult or nymphal exodiscapularis tick, and it has to have been attached for greater than or equal to 36 hours. Obviously, if you, you, know, you don't know, you didn't see the tick get attached, presumably, because you wouldn't usually leave it on. So you're kind of guessing based on when they were exposed, but you know, if the kid was out in the woods for hours yesterday and then, um, or two days ago and hasn't been back outside since, you may have an idea of the timing, and then you can look at how big the tick is. There's another clue to how long it's been on. Uh, but it takes a while for uh, the spirochetes to make their way from the tick into the person. So um, it needs to be pretty engorged for there to be a risk of transmission. Um, you have to be able to start prophylaxis within 72 hours of the tick removal. Um, you have to have a high enough suspicion for Lyme. So the local rate of infection of uh, Exodes ticks with, with Lyme has to be greater than or equal to 20%. As I mentioned, we have that in our area. They're about 33%. So that part's always met. And then doxycycline treatment has to not be contraindicated. So um, with adults, this is done pretty frequently. With kids, um, it's a little tougher. We generally don't recommend it because, again, there's some, you know, we don't have a really clear picture of what the degree of risks are of two staining with doxycycline. And this is a scenario where you're not dealing with a sick kid who needs some kind of treatment. You're dealing with sort of preventing something that can be treated later on if need be. So we don't typically, typically recommend it. There's no amoxicillin option for a prophylactic treatment. The doxycycline seems to work better because it concentrates intracellularly and probably hangs around for a long time, even with a single dose, and um, prevents things, it prevents the spirochetes from replicating. But amoxicillin doesn't have the same option. So the only option in this case, if you were to use amoxicillin, would be to do a full treatment course, which we don't recommend. So usually we just tell families in these scenarios to watch very closely for a rash or for any symptoms. Um, uh, so you can do, theoretically, you can t do antibody testing now as sort of a baseline and repeat in four weeks or so. We also generally don't recommend this because you can have false positive results and, um, and because most of the later manifestations of Lyme do have classic enough presentations that you can pretty, you know, it's fairly straightforward to treat at that point. But this can be a little tough and it causes a lot of anxiety, of course, for families. Um, so in terms of tick identification, the CDC website, I have a link down there, but if we just Google CDC ticks, it will pop up. They have some good tick identification um, images. And the key with Ixodi scapularis ticks is they're very plain. They're not, so we sometimes get these ticks sent into the lab to, be, you know, to identify the species. So they don't have, um, a dog tick will have little kind of, they call them uh, like decorations. They, they'll have little like ridges, like a little serrated cloth around the edge of their bodies. Ixodes don't. Um, they don't have any color on this sputum, this um, dark part here. They have a long mouth, which like the long pointy mouth, which dog ticks don't. Um, so they're pretty distinctive looking. When they get really engorged, some of these distinctions can be a little harder to tell. Um, but anyway, and the larva only has six legs, and they don't generally transmit lines. So if it's a nymph, they're also extremely, extremely tiny. Nymph or larger, they'll have four legs, um, and it's the females and the nymphs who generally transmit disease. Um, and then this is from the infectious, the IDSA guidelines. They have these pictures of ticks at different stages of engorgement. Um, so 36 hours is you know somewhere between here. So the ticks have to be pretty um, fat and juicy to be actually transmitting anything. So they're often found before that. You know, I think the main time when you find them is when you haven't realized that they're this big is if they're in the hair or something like that. But. Um, so here's a scenario, I don't know if anyone's encountered this, but a family brings in a tick, they find it on their child, and they want the tick to be sent for Lyme testing to see if the kid could have gotten Lyme. 
Um, so this is not recommended because there are tests to test ticks, and they're done for epidemiologic purposes, and some labs will kind of offer them on a cash basis so you know, a family can sort of send the tick in, or a doctor can send the tick in. It's generally going to cost the family a lot of money and not going to be covered by insurance, and we really don't know what to do with the results, so the tests are not sort of designed for this purpose. Um, and, um, you know, again, you sort of already know in an area like this that a tick has a pretty good chance of being infected with Borrelia, so it's useful. It can still be useful to have them bring the tick in, but the things that are really more useful are seeing how engorged is it, and is it truly an Ixodes tick? Is it truly a tick? Sometimes people will bring something in that's not even a tick at all, some other kind of bug, or it's like a piece of wood that got stuck to them. <laughs> so looking at it can be useful, but um, it's really a situation where what you can tell by looking at it is going to give you most of the information. Um, so here's another scenario. You have the 17-year-old girl who comes in. Um, she's had several months of fatigue, and she's had Lyme testing done somewhere, either in your clinic or elsewhere, or in the, you know, wherever. And she has a positive Lyme test. So her EIA was positive, and the Western blood IgG was positive. So the algorithm was followed appropriately, and she has a positive result. So are her symptoms attributable to Lyme? If she has no other specific Lyme attributable symptoms, so no meningitis, no facial palsy, no arthritis, nothing else, it's probably a false positive result, especially in an area um, like this. Well, actually, I shouldn't say it's probably wherever you are, it can be a false positive. The reason for false positives around here um, can be either a true false positive, the test just reacted with something that's not a Lyme antigen, which happens you know, with all tests at some rate. But there's also a lot of people who've had subclinical seroconversion in the past. So they may have sort of had Lyme, it was controlled by their immune system. They have IgG that's lingering, um, but it has nothing to do with the current presentation. And this is, um, you know, somewhere around 5%, 4 or 5% of the population in endemic areas will have this if you just sort of test people off the street. And um, it's likely not related. So testing is generally not recommended. Testing for Lyme is not usually recommended in patients who have um, sort of nonspecific symptoms. As far as we know, Lyme doesn't typically cause these kind of long-term symptoms. If you have early localized disease, certainly fatigue associated with other constitutional symptoms can occur. Um, but, but lingering very vague symptoms are not generally thought to be attributable to Lyme. And you can start on a pretty tricky path of knowing, you know, at this point it's unclear what stage of Lyme you're treating. If you try to treat it, if the patient doesn't get better, um, then do you escalate to a higher level you know, to an IV treatment? And, so, you know, for various reasons, we generally say only test for Lyme if you have a specific manifestation that's consistent with it. Um, and kind of along those lines, post-Lyme disease syndromes. So this is, you know, obviously an area where there's a lot of online discussion and a lot of um, uh, patient groups and a lot of controversy, although I would say within the infectious disease community, not probably too much controversy, but the... Um, as far as we know, persistent symptoms after treatment of Lyme is almost never due to ongoing spirochete infection. And it, you know, this is challenging because spirochetes are not, we can't culture, we essentially can't culture them apart from very specialized settings. The antibody responses can persist for a long time. So it's tough and I think it's easy to see how it can be, um, I think it's hard for patients to feel that you've definitively determined that there's absolutely no spirochete in there, um, anywhere in their body. But we have pretty good evidence that um, that this doesn't happen, and I think the most important point is that um, there, there have at this point been a lot of very, um, very good studies showing that prolonged courses of antibiotic therapy beyond traditional um, standard guideline treatments of Lyme disease don't have a sustained improvement on um, kind of nonspecific chronic effects of, or chronic um, symptoms that are attributed to Lyme disease. There are things to consider, though. So other tick-borne infect co-infections, um, like Babesia and Anaplasma, are worth testing for. Babesia in particular, because it's not treated by, um, you know, if the patient has been treated for Lyme, Babesia wouldn't have been treated with doxycycline, um, and that can cause a, sort of a variety of symptoms. I did mention this kind of one exception is that sometimes you do have to repeat a course of antibiotics for persistent Lyme arthritis symptoms, and that's pretty specific to arthritis. And then again, if symptoms are persisting after that, um, it's not likely to continue to be ongoing infection. It's probably either um, ongoing inflammation without infection or you know, an autoimmune process of some kind. One thing that in these scenarios I think is useful to talk to patients about, particularly after meningitis, is that there may be a while before they feel back to normal. Lyme meningitis is not as um, purulent or acute meningitis as a um, uh, Haemophilus or meningococcal meningitis, but it's still meningitis, it's still an infection in the spinal fluid, it's still, you know, there's a lot of um, cerebral 
irritation from this process. And so people will often not really feel great or not feel like themselves for a long time. When, you know, again, we have pretty good evidence that this is not because there's ongoing untreated infection or because they need more antibiotics, but it's not unexpected. So I think that that can be helpful to patients to hear and to know that it's not necessarily a sign of something going wrong if it's taking them a little while to, to get back to themselves. Um, so I'm now, I'll just very briefly, so there's time for questions, I'll just mention the two other tick-borne infections that we primarily think about in Massachusetts. Uh, and these are covered in, the Red Book talks about them and they're covered in that IDSA guideline. Babesia is probably a little bit more common of the two. Um, this is caused by a parasite that, um, that invades red blood cells. It's related to malaria. Um, it's spread by Ixodes uh, ticks as well. And there's actually evidence that if, if you have an increased likelihood of getting Babesia um, if you also get Lyme. So if you have a tick that's co-infected, it can transmit both of them. So this isn't, it's not an Occam's razor situation where if you have Lyme, it's sort of, you're done. If you have some, you don't necessarily always have to test for Babesia, but if there's symptoms that don't quite make sense or don't go away, then it's definitely worth considering. Um, usually there's sort of vague, non-specific symptoms, especially in kids. They tend to, it tends to be a pretty mild disease and is probably often just not even noticed and is clear without any intervention. Uh, but it can be severe in immunocompromised patients. It can be transmitted through uh, blood transfusion. So Massachusetts has started screening um, blood for Babesia pretty recently, I think initially on a research basis. Uh, you can see hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, elevated liver enzymes. So some of the things you might expect, you know, if you sort of think of it as being similar to malaria. Um, the main modes of diagnosis are a peripheral blood smear, so the lab will just look at the red blood cells to see if there's parasites inside them, as you would for uh, malaria. You can do a PCR from the blood. You can do antibody testing, which is usually a little bit less useful. Um, and again, people often have probably, you know, have this in clear and we never know. If you do treat it, the important point is that the treatment is different than it is for most of the other tick-borne infections, so different from Lyme or um, anaplasma. The two options are clindamycin plus quinine or azithromycin plus atovaquone. Neither have a great evidence base behind it. There was some data in um, hamsters and stuff has kind of been extrapolated from that, but um, otherwise healthy kids tend to do very well really with or without treatment for Babesia. But it is worth considering if you have unexplained symptoms in a patient with Lyme. And then anaplasma is the other, um, the final tick-borne infection that we see in this area with some regularity, although again, especially in kids, it's really pretty uncommon. Um, this is an intracellular bacterium. Again, it has pretty, usually pretty nonspecific manifestations, but can cause meningitis or encephalopathy. It's diagnosed usually by PCR. It can be seen on a blood smear. You can see the little bacteria inside white blood cells, but that's not a very sensitive test. Um, and the treatment option for this is really just doxycycline. So that, the other reason that you usually tend to worry about this less, in addition to it not being as common, is that uh, if you've treated somebody with doxycycline for Lyme disease, you've probably gotten the anaplasma too, but it's worth considering. Um, and I think that's it. I'm happy to give you questions. I'm not sure. Working.